Hallelujah. Turn with me to scripture now as our call to worship scripture. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. You follow along as we continue to praise our Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again of a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Thanks be to God. Let us sing of our inexpressible joy. It's hymn number 217, Oh, How I Love Jesus. If you're able, let's stand and sing together. take a moment to welcome those around you who've come to worship with you this morning. What a privilege. If you are worshiping with us by way of live stream or television, we thank God for you. We count you as a part of this fellowship. So we hope that what happens here is happening in your home. You feel the presence of the Lord. God bless you and welcome to worship. Amen. Welcome to worship. And we're glad you are able to worship with us, the First Baptist Church of San Antonio, this morning. If you're new to our church and you're in the room, we want to get to know you. The way we do that are these cards that look like this. If you take this and fill it out and put it in the offering plate, this is how we get to know you. They should be in the pew backs in front of you. For those of you watching on television this morning, we'd love to get to know you as well. There's a similar online version of this card on our website, fbcsa.org. Just at the top of the page, hit the connect button, and we want to get to know you as well. 
You know, every Sunday morning we have a, a number of different worship services here. Um, this particular morning we have an extra one off campus. In fact, about 200 of our members have been on an all-church retreat this weekend, and they finished up worship there not long ago. But you know, one of the things that we talk about in our church is there's unity across all of those services for particular reasons. One of those is because of who Jesus Christ is. We worship a risen Lord, and we do that together. It's the same spirit, right? It doesn't matter if we're down by the river or we're here in the sanctuary. It is the same spirit of God drawing us into worship. And one of the unique things here that we love is that we are unified around the Scripture. And wherever we worship, we have the same text. And we worship together in that text all week long. And so we're grateful for our opportunity to worship in this room in this ta- uh, at this time and across this campus, and across South Texas, worshiping one Lord in His Spirit, in His Word. And so this is a privilege, and I'm forever grateful that we get to do it together. Let's pray together, and we'll continue to worship. Lord, we pray that in these moments, Your Spirit would be powerful and recognizable. Lord, that you would open our eyes and our ears to your wonderful work that's happening. Lord, we know your spirit is moving and we don't want to miss it. Father, help us. By the blood of Jesus Christ, show us your way. And may our lives be transformed by the movement of your spirit. Lord, we we pray that you would make it so among us this morning, wherever we're worshiping. Make it so and make it mighty. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So grateful that Pastor, in his welcome and his prayer, spoke of unity. It is is unity that we are singing about and, and thinking about today. Um, now look at Romans chapter 12 with me, This how this passage speaks so very well to where we've been reading all week long, unified in Scripture across this campus and across this church. You follow along as I read, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's continue to sing now that we are indeed redeemed. It's hymn number 531. If you're able, let's stand together and sing.
That my my box is heavy today. Oh, come on down, everybody. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Come down. All right. I've got a bunch of stuff to show y'all this morning. Come on down, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Come down. All right. Yeah. You still got time? Come on down. Come on down. All right, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some different items. And I'm going to ask you to judge between those items, okay? So I'm going to show you, I'm going to hold up two different things, and you tell me which of the two is best, okay? All right, let me work through here. I'm going to work through my stuff here. All right, here are two t-shirts, two black t-shirts from this church. All right, here's a black t-shirt. Can you see this one? There's that one. It says media on it. Here's another one. It says repent, witness, disciple. Which one is best? This one? That one or this one? The repentance one? Oh, good. I like that. All right, good. All right, let's take this. All right, I got two books here. Uh, the New Dictionary of Theology and Expositions of Holy Scripture by Alexander McLaren. Which one is best? This one is best? We like Alexander McLaren? Good. Ah, oh, good job. I like that too. All right. Now I got two toys here. One's a George Gervin bobblehead. The other is a Flash toy. Which one is best? Flash. Flash is best? Better than the Iceman? Which one? This one's best? Bobblehead. The, the Bob. Oh, I don't, we're mixed there. All right. Let me give you another one here. I got, I got two candies. Let's judge between these two. Okay. I've got a Kit Kat and a Reese's. All right, which which one is best? Everybody says Kit Kat. I got a couple. All right, I got one more thing to show you. All right, no, you can't eat the candy. All right, here we go. All right, um, I've got two cups that that um, different people have given me. These are gifts. All right, which you have to judge. Which one is best? Which one do you think? The the black one or the white one? Wait, y'all, y'all can't agree on any of this. Huh? The black one? You like the black one better? Black one. All right, I feel like the only thing y'all really agreed on, well, Alexander McLaren, I think y'all agreed on that. And then y'all also agreed on the shirt, right? It was this one. All right, that was good. But on the rest of it, we were kind of all over the map, weren't we? All right, so this is, this is what I want you to listen for in the sermon today. So in the sermon, we start talking about judging. And it's talking about judging between people. And kind of between two people. And we were saying, who is best between two people? There's a couple of things I want you to listen for in that. One is that God is the judge. Right? When it comes down to it, God is the one who is always the judge. And two, I want you to listen to this in the sermon too. When it comes down to who is best... When it comes to us, it always goes back to Jesus, that Jesus is best. And so when we have to choose, even between us and him, he is best. So listen for that in the sermon today, okay? All right, let's pray together and we'll go. Lord, we thank you for each one of these students. We pray your grace in their lives and truth would reign in their hearts. Lord, show them your goodness and remind them of how much you love them. And Lord, we pray that you would build them up into great men and women of God. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Let's continue to add our hearts and voices to our worship today. It's hymn number 378, Christian Hearts in Love United. Let's stand together as we sing.
Let's turn now to our reverse text for the week. It's, it's in your bulletin, Matthew 7, 1 through 6, and verse 12. If you'll find that, we're going to read it aloud together. And let's stand as we read. This, then, is the text for today. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For that, the law and the prophets. May God bless the reading of His Word. The first three words of Matthew chapter 7 are a real problem. The first three words you see there are, do not judge. These three words have been manipulated and thrown back into the faces of Christians since Jesus uttered them. You will usually hear people quote some version of this in their own way. Somewhere near, do not judge me. Or something like, you are not my judge. Which on the highest spiritual level is true. But this section of Matthew 7 is often treated as a three-word text when it contains so much more. Jesus did not say, do not judge, and then end the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't say, do not judge, and the Gospels are closed. There's a great deal more to consider here, even in this very paragraph. And usually what people mean When they say something like, don't you judge me, it's coming from a place of deep conviction. It's a a knee-jerk reaction of guilt or a, a burden of insecurity. And one of the things that we have to wrestle with is this is a primary problem, um, both in the church and, and in society is that we regularly refuse to acknowledge our own sin by saying something like, don't judge me when we feel convicted. We run when the Spirit of God begins to shed light on our sin and our failure. Now, I do want to be clear here. What Jesus says is true. And when Jesus says, do not judge, there are a couple of concepts that we need to clarify as we work down through this. One of those things that we need to clarify as we work down through this is even that that person wrestling with the conviction of sin who says, you're not my judge. They're They're right. You and I are not the judge. There is an eternal judge, the sovereign one, who sits on a throne that is his and his alone. You know, it is not us who will punish the people in our lives who hurt us. It is not for us to claim vengeance. It is the Lord's alone. And there have been plenty of times 
where churches and believers have sought to steal that authority from the throne of God and take it as their own when we know it is He who is the sovereign judge. There's one thing we need to clarify. The second matter of clarification here is we move down into verse 2 that we need to make. Jesus makes this judgment a matter of measurement. In, in our previous study where we were working through Galatians, we learned as we work through Galatians together that practically there are only two standards of measurement. We're not talking about the metric system here, but we're talking about there are earthly standards and there are heavenly standards. And practically, you're going to operate between one of the two, the earthly standard of measurement or the heavenly standard of measurement. And there's only one way that is redeeming. There's only one way you will find hope, and that is towards heaven. So Jesus says that there's, there's two standards of measurement here. So let's talk about the earthly one. Let's talk about the heaven, or excuse me, the human standard of measurement. And the human standards of measurement will randomize themselves. And this is what I mean by this. Over the course of time, human standards of measurement or earthly standards of judgment constantly change. Sometimes they linger longer than others, but there is this constant shift in, in what it means to be righteous in the eyes of this, our society, our countries, the, the people across the globe, it, it is this moving target of what it means to be righteous. And it changes at the whims of the largest mobs. And know this, this is true under every human institution of judgment both legitimate ones and illegitimate ones. Under every human standard of measurement, you will fail. There, there's no possible way where you don't fail. Even if one day you succeed, the mark will be moved and you will fail the next day. By all the human measurements, you will be condemned. When put under a microscope, things that will hit, were hidden, things that are festering, will be brought out and you will be condemned, convicted, a lawbreaker. Every earthly, every human measurement will condemn us. And this is this is how we, we think about human measurements. They they bring this this pressure into our lives. They bring guilt into our lives. They they're meant to be destructive. They're meant to be condemning, and they are always changing. But there's a heavenly measure too. The heavenly measure, though it's defined by perfection in Jesus. There's a different way about it. It doesn't just expose our imperfections. You see, it's similar to the, the earthly measurements here, in that there is this exposure. But, but in the earthly way, the exposure is meant to destroy you. In the heavenly way, the, the heavenly measurement, it heals all those imperfections. That, that Jesus Christ is the healer who mends our wounds. And by the grace of God, we are called righteous by the blood of Jesus. There is deep exposure, but it brings about a welcomed healing that every one of us needs. Now, as Jesus moves down through, when you get to verses 3 through 5, Jesus is explaining something about a primary Christian response, about who we are in Him. 
that anybody that turns to Jesus is turning from that which was to him. That anybody who follows Jesus has to adjust their life. When you, when you follow Jesus, when you come to Jesus, you will not remain the same. We turn, we follow, we repent. Christianity, for one who believes in Jesus, is a transformative exercise. And in these verses, at the beginning of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus describes that transformative exercise as log removal. That, that there, is, there is this significant healing that takes place in us as, as we remove a log that is, is jammed into our eye and it's taken out by the hand of the Christ. And everything about us, our, our words, our actions, our lives are now defined in that healing of how, how Jesus has removed that from us and we have been healed by his body and his blood. That now, because of the Christ, we can see clearly. See, Jesus starts with you. And God, God's will for your life always begins with this self-reflection in the Spirit. As Jesus is working down through these verses, 3, 4, and 5, He, he says, to, to your own ways, to your own heart, to your, to your own eye, to your own mind. Th this is about you. Your relationship with Jesus is deeply impacting who you are. And that's where this life begins and flourishes with Jesus. You know, as he works through these verses, he says, you know, everybody's happy to point out the ways that, that others are living contradictory lives. Humans are really good at that. We're, we, we, we know how to point out the imperfection in our neighbor. But the way of Jesus is to turn and in the Spirit, be able to wrestle with your own imperfections. Right? We, we, don't, we don't like to be put under the microscope. We like to grab other people and put them under the microscope. But Jesus says, with Him, we submit and, and our lives are transformed by His power and His presence. See, being, being near to Jesus is going to upend your life. He's going to flip tables in your heart. So you su submit to Him. Receive this work. And there are going to be moments of deep pain. But there's a difference. In those earthly measurements, it's meant to crush you. These moments with Jesus will restore you, bring holy healing. We, we know there, there is a destructive work of God. We see moments in Scripture where, where God brings destruction. But this work in your heart, for you as a believer, is a creative work. It's a, it's a recreation in you. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. See, we're, we're to be a repentant people. And following Jesus means recognizing your sins and exposing them to the disinfectant of the light. It's interesting, there's, there's a number of places in Scripture when, when we come to these moments, because repentance is on nearly every page of the Scripture. And, and as we begin to talk about repentance, there, there are plenty of moments, too, in the Scriptures where God reveals His ways, where He shows us what, what sin looks like. And He tells the stories of sinful ones. And so we, when we wrestle the, with this in the Spirit, there's, there's a number of different things that we look at we're talking about sin. So one of those in the Old Testament, we, we look at the Ten Commandments, right? Those are a good place to begin. And we come to the, the New Testament, we hear Jesus talk about two commandments. The first and the greatest and the second is like it. It's a good place to begin. 
As you move further into the New Testament, right, we have the epistles. And throughout the epistles, we, we have a, a number of varied vice lists where we have these, these lists that begin to show what sin looks like in a person. Um, it's interesting, too, when we get to Revelation, Jesus is talking to churches there. In five of the seven churches, he begins to expose sin in those, those churches. One of them hits particularly close to home, that Laodicea. He says, you in the church, you're, you're too comfortable. In fact, you, you have too much. In, in your wealth, you, you don't feel like you have need anymore. You feel like you can take care of yourself. You don't feel like you need God. And again, he's, he's talking to the church there, saying you've become this lukewarm mess. Just be zealous and repent. And so we, we have these, these moments in Scripture where they, they highlight sins to help us as we move forward in repentance. And Jesus does the same thing for us here. I want to note three here in particular. Where Jesus says three things here. He says, you need to repent of. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's saying, you this morning, you need to repent. You need to come to me in confession in this way. So sin number one, and it's in that three through five. Jesus is calling us to repentance. For any time we've, we've judged someone else, before genuine self-reflection in the Spirit. I, mean, I want to be careful here. There, there, there are genuine times where in the church, and particularly we need to hold one another accountable. And we need to talk about sin that is in others' lives. There, there are times we need to speak the truth into temptation. See, here, as Jesus says these things, He's not saying ignore sin. He's not, he's not saying be desensitized to the failure of others, but what he is saying is there is there's no place for you to speak wisely on those matters without repentance, without the Spirit of God working on your heart. You can only imagine sin with its remedy in Jesus Christ Himself. And so it's, it's destructive when we come to these moments and we don't recognize we're a sinner saved by grace, when we start to believe or imagine or act like we're the judge, we fall. Because we're not the judge. We are a sinner saved by the grace of God. And if we ever take any posture other than we are a sinner saved by grace, we need to fall to our knees in repentance. Come to the cross of Jesus Christ. There's a second sin here, too, that we need to look at. It's, it's in verse 6, and this one's more difficult, where Jesus says, don't take what is valuable, is it holy or pearl, or something that, that is extremely valuable, and, and give it to somebody who's going to destroy it. So it's interesting, we, we understand the concept, but it's hard to know the specifics. In fact, if you, you know, look through all the scholarship, um, they say, when you get to specifics, we're not entirely sure what Jesus is talking about. But as we work through this, we recognize we have been, been given much in this life. God has given us new life in Jesus. We, we, we have ourself, our, our, our bodies, who we are. We've been given the gospel, right? We've been given resources. We've been given an abundance of, of, of things that God has placed in our lives. We've been given each other, right? We've been given the church. And we want to be very careful to be wise in how we handle those things. Not to hand them over to destruction, but to be careful stewards of everything that God has given us. And for everything that we have, for everything that we are, may we be intentional and careful 
to serve the kingdom of God with those things and with the Spirit of God. Number three, Jesus mentions down in verse 12, is repent this very morning for treating poorly the people that I brought into your life this week. You should have loved them. You should have been affectionate with them. You should have recognized their value and you missed it. You treat, treat people the way you want to be treated. This, this is an active working out of our faith in relationship. You know, Jesus is saying here, these relationships matter. The relationships inside the church, the relationships in our families, the, the relationships that you have throughout the week, these are moments that God has given you. These are interactions from heaven for you to live out the faith that God is developing in your heart. We know God, God has placed people into your lives. These interactions have been ordained by God. And we need to view them as such. Right? Wait, may we view the people who God brings into our lives as ordained interactions opportunities for obedience and growth in us. And Jesus, for every time you've missed it, let us repent. As you hear these sins, so Jesus kind of gives us three here, and we know there's, there's many more as you turn through the pages of Scripture. And as we recognize these things in our lives, when, when, we, when we falter and miss it, or when, when we, we make steps forward and we're growing in the faith, that all of this comes in and by the person of Jesus. So that when we stand before the throne of God, our only defense is that I'm with the Christ. And nothing else. I love Jesus and I'm going to follow him with all of my heart. May that be us this morning. May that be us as a church. Let's pray together. Lord, we, we pray that as we come to a moment of response, that in the same breath you would break our hearts and heal our hearts. Lord, that you would rip out the sin and be our healing. Lord, that you would draw in near to us as a body. Lord, to make us whole. And we pray now, as we come to this time of response, Lord, if there's anything we need to repent of, that we wouldn't retain it any longer, but that we would leave it at the cross. And Lord, we, we pray that your spirit would continue and renew this transformative work in us. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. This is your time to respond. How is the Lord working? How is He moving in you? Um, there's a number of things that you can do. We're going to sing. We're going to give. The altar is open. Come down, pray at the altar. Um, uh, I'll be down front. Pastor Brian will be down front. We want to pray with you. We want to receive you. If you want to talk about accepting Christ or, or being a part of this church, um, come visit with us um, during this time. So as we, as we gather in these moments, be sensitive to the Spirit in where Jesus is calling. So if you need to, you can remain seated. The rest, let's stand as we respond.